Today's sermon is, again, something I knew I was going to be doing for about a month and a half, although the basis of it was something that started quite a while ago in me, and it's based on my observations of my life and the observations, really, of this church. Um, the things that I saw this church doing and me doing and God speaking into my heart. We all have a testimony. Everybody has a testimony. But we as Christians, we have a testimony that counts for eternity, one way or the other. And our testimony is seen by the world. We, the church, see each other's testimony. The world sees our testimony, sees what we're doing all the time. And Satan sees our testimony. And he's constantly watching, looking for cracks, looking for chinks. In the law, a testimony is a form of evidence that is obtained from a witness who makes a solemn statement or a declaration of fact. Testimony may be oral or written, and it is usually made by oath or an affirmation under penalty of perjury. Now, in that it's said, it's a form of evidence. Church, our lives is the evidence of our testimony. The witnesses is the world that watches what we do every day, all day, no matter what. Our testimony and how we present it or live is of the most importance. I'm reading, I'm reading from the New American Standard, and they don't have that one, so you're going to read, you're going to see it in the NIV, right? So, Brandon says it's very different. I don't think you can get saved with one and not the other. Um, they're both good. But this is Revelation chapter 12, verses 10 and 11, and then 17. And it says, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down, he who accuses them before our God day and night. And they overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their testimony. And they did not love their life even when faced with death. Father, I pray, God, that as we take your word today and apply it to our lives, Lord, I pray that we will hear, we will listen, we will apply it, we will use it, Lord. We will take account of who we are and what our testimony is, Lord. Father, I pray that your God would come down here today, that there would be no... Uh, Wise words, but the power of God. Taking what is said, what we discuss, and applying it to our lives. Lord, thank you. Touch. Touch this time, I pray in Jesus' name. So the word of God says in these verses, we overcome by our testimony. We overcome by our testimony. What is that testimony? Is it just what we do? No. First of all, it's our faith in Christ. Before we do anything, if you're here today and you have not put trust in Christ, I strongly encourage you to consider that, to put your trust in Christ, in his shed blood, because that's the only way you're going to go to be with the Father someday. There is no other way. I wish there was, but there isn't. I wish there was for the sake of the world, but there isn't. He is the way. It's his blood that was shed on the cross. But then, obviously we overcome by that. But then we overcome by the word of our testimony. What we do with our lives. Who we are. Do you want to be a strong Christian? Or do you want to be just a Christian that gets by? A believer that just gets by. I want my testimony to be strong. I want it to be impeccable. I want it to be without error. It's not, but I want it to be. We need to want that. You know, if, if 
The world is watching. They can see everything we do. They can see the strong points and the weak points. If I watch, and we moved into our, our neighborhood, they were building houses all around. And I could sit there and see how houses were being built. And I could see, if I wanted to, I could watch them closely. I could watch mine because there was one point where they were doing something I didn't want them to do. And I caught it. And if I hadn't caught it, it wouldn't have turned out the way I wanted. Okay? But if I watch that builder from the very base all the way up build that house, I see you know, how he builds the block. I see how he puts down the cement. I see how he frames that house. You know, I can tell the good and the bad points. I can tell if he, oh, look at that. He's got the walls, now he's drywalling it, but there's no insulation in there. That ain't gonna work in the middle of our, our, our winter days. It's not gonna work, you're gonna have a cold house, okay? The same thing goes for us. The world sees what we're doing. Whether we think so or not, the world sees. You know, it's funny, we think sometimes we can get away with stuff. And you might be able to hide things from the world, but you can't hide them from Satan. He sees, and he is before God day and night trying to accuse you. Verse 17 says in that same passage, So the dragon was enraged with the woman, and went off to make war with the rest of her children who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. Our testimony needs to be one that keeps the commandments of Jesus. It can't just be, yeah, I believe in Jesus, but, you know, I got these areas that, we all have areas, but are they areas that we willingly allow to be there? Or are they areas that we struggle with? Hopefully there are areas we struggle with and we keep going to God and telling him, I don't want to be struggling. Obedience to Jesus needs to be our testimony. And overcoming testimony is one that obeys Jesus. My goal today is to look at our testimony and determine what it actually looks like to us and everyone who is watching and then what are we going to do about it. Before I go further, it's going to be hard. It's hard for me to look at my own life. Some of it's hard. I want to share a little bit, not about our testimony, about how I look at that. A couple weeks ago, three weeks ago, I, I, did, I started to fast. And, and it was a significant, significant amount of time. You know, and, and again, I'm, it's not about me. I'm not bragging about this, okay? I'm just telling you what God did in me. But it was a different. I, I fasted before, and in this one, it was hard. It seemed like I, I wasn't seeing what I, what I thought I should be seeing. And I will say that one good thing that came out of this was that it has changed the way I eat. And I struggled with that for years, that I know what I should do. But I wasn't doing it. And I, and, I, and I told my wife, I said, I really think because I chose to do that, I changed the way I'm eating to be better. To not eat basically sugar. And the amounts of sugar that I can put into my being isn't good for me. Okay? So I, that's just a, that's a boast on God. That's, I'm, I'm lifting up God in that because that's going to be good for my life. But what came out of that in Near the end of this fast, very close to the end, I was praying upstairs in the youth room one day, and I was, this message was working in me. And, and I said, Lord, I have to be able to do this boldly. And it was as if God came down and just for a minute, just touched me. And he said, do it boldly. Do it. Proclaim the message. And so, even though this may be hard, we need to understand, we need to hear, church, what we're doing and how we may, we, you may be perfect, your testimony might be impeccable, 
but it may not be true. And I have to say, this, this message is based on what I have seen my old life and the life of this church. So why am I doing it? I'm doing it because God has directed me to. In 2 Corinthians 3.12, and I always have a lot of scripture, so it says, Therefore, having such a hope, we use great boldness in our speech. I am doing it because of my hope in who he is and who he wants me to be. Romans 15, 14 through 17 says, And concerning you, my brother, I myself also am convinced that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able also to admonish one another. But I have written boldly to you on some point, so as to remind you again, because of the grace that was given to me from God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles, ministering as a priest of the gospel of God, so that my offering of the Gentiles may become acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, in Christ Jesus, I have found reason for boasting in things pertaining to God. It's my responsibility. As a pastor, it's my responsibility to do what God leads me to do. I want to make this church an acceptable offering. I want this church to be an acceptable offering to God. Why do I want that? Because the world is watching. The world's watching this church. And we need to understand that. Why am I doing this? Ezekiel 44, 23 says, Moreover, they shall teach my people the difference between the holy and the profane and cause them to discern between the unclean and the clean. Church, I believe that I grew up in this I didn't grow up in this church. When I was 21 years old, I became a Christian. A year later, I started coming to this church. I've really never been in another church after that. So I've seen it go through a lot of transitions. And I've seen the church in general, at least in my area of experience, gravitate away from God. And that's scary. That's scary to me. We need to learn the difference between the, the profane and the holy. All through scripture, God is admonishing the church. In the book of Revelation, you have seven churches. Six of them were admonished by him. Some of them strongly. These were the believers of Jesus Christ. And he admonished them in their points. In the, where their, wit, their testimony was weak. The Corinthian church, Paul, they were a little crazy. And, and Paul had to admonish them. Teach them the right way to go. The Old Testament Israel. One year ago today, I started reading through the Bible. Yesterday, I finished. Um, and through that process, I had to read like 14 chapters. <laughs> but all through the Old Testament, and even the New Testament, I see a God who, this is what I thought. He's like a parent. Almost yelling at the kids. I'm going to do this if you don't listen. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. And I thought, you know, sometimes it, it, it's threatening. And then I, and I sat back and I said, because he loves us. He loves you and me. And he wants our testimony to be perfect. He wants our testimony to shine. And so he wants us to do what's right. That, that, that message came strong, strong to me. Why am I doing this? Book of Haggai 5 through 7 says, Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have so much, but harvest little. You eat, but there is not enough to be satisfied. You drink, but there is not enough to be drunk, become drunk. You put on clothing, but no one is warm enough. And he who earns earns wages to put into a purse with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. It's time for us to consider our ways. It's time for us to think about what we're doing with our lives. We're going to talk about it. We're going to talk about the observations that I've seen. We need to consider our ways. You know why? I vote. Because CNN is watching. Is 
they're, they're looking to find fault. Hebrews 2.1 says, for this reason, we must pay closer attention, much closer attention to what we have heard, what you have heard today, so that we do not drift away from it. Today, let's listen to what God is saying to us. Why? Because the accuser is waiting. He's waiting to find fault with you and me. I have much excitement and anticipation. I used to become very discouraged when I saw the church do things that I thought were wrong. I don't get discouraged in that. I don't like it, but I, you know what? I'm going to preach the message. I'm going to speak my, what I believe is true, but it's up to God, and I am. John Chester and I, we come on Friday nights and we pray. Andrew used to be with us, but he, he went. He's missing out. I miss him. I miss him greatly. But we come on Friday nights and we pray the power of God upon this church. We pray that God will pour out his Holy Spirit. Every Friday night that we can be here, we're here praying. And we believe in the power of God. And this is my prayer. That the power of God will fall. I'm excited because God wants me to be better. He wants you to be better. <coughs> this isn't for criticism. This is for his power. I, I, why am I admonishing? So that the spirit can convict and our testimony can be without fault. And I'll end this area. No action on our part will have enough consequences. It will have consequences. So what is our testimony? Based on my observations and in light of God's word, this church is what I've seen. This is where it gets hard. What kind of a testimony can we have? Well, you can have a sin testimony. There can be sin in our life. You look in the New Testament and it's constantly admonishing, teaching us to flee sin. How? I'm going to share some things that I've seen from this body of people. We have attitudes towards authority. Oh. Number one, the president of this country, I don't really like his ways. I don't, I'm nothing about him. I don't like his policies. But I am called to pray for him. And I have seen Christians, and I have heard Christians, even to the point of saying, I'm, I don't even want to pray for them. You don't have that option. I don't have that option. I've seen kids on Facebook from other churches call him an idiot on Facebook. That is sin. And that is wrong. We, we do not have that right to do that. We're not uh, given that opportunity. 1 Timothy 2, 1 and 2 says, First of all, then I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgivings, be made on behalf of all men, for kings, and all who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. We don't have a right to bad mouth our president. And believe me, I've had to repent because I have. I'm, I'm learning, I'm doing, I'm doing better. But I've heard us, this church, bad mouth our president. And we, we should be praying for him. You know what we should be telling the world? We could say, I don't like his policies, but I'm praying for him. Do you know what kind of a testimony that is? They're going to say, wow, you don't like him, but he's praying for him. That's going to make good waves. I'm encouraging you that way. That's what we need to do. We, we badmouth church leadership. You may not agree with what goes on in this church. But you have your pastor, you have elected Board members, Hebrews 13, 17, which I won't read, it says, pray for your leadership. You may not agree. You don't have to agree. But when the rubber meets the road, we need to fall under that authority and that uh, leadership. This court, this church, sometimes, I know it's hard to believe, but sometimes we cause discord. I don't have a scripture. You know why? In parentheses, I'm going to teach you something now. In parentheses, Google it. 
Because you can find any scripture you ever need if you know what you're looking for with Google. And I'm saying that, use the tools that the world has given us to, to know more about this. Use it. Outbursts of anger. I've seen them. Now, we all lose our temper, don't we? It's one thing to lose our temper, church. But it's another thing not to fix it. Galatians 5.20, again, I'm not going to read it, but it talks about outbursts of anger. And that's just one. There's, in that verse, there are other things. We need to fix the sin, and we don't. We don't. We walk away, and we need to fix it. But the world needs to know. When I'm at work, and there are times when I lose it, and, and I really, I have to go to people and say, I'm sorry. And that's hard. It's so hard. It is. Saying I'm sorry is powerful, but it's hard. We need to show the world that we're different. We need to be light. Life choices. Today we're talking about how to point them out. What are life choices? Matthew 6, 22 and 23. Because this is, now it's going to get really hard. The eye is the lamp of the body. So then if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? We live in an interesting times. The technology that we have is amazing. Uh, even overrunning us. The cell phone technology, you know, the internet technology, the TV technology, it's amazing. But this doesn't change. It never has changed. And it has been my observation that within this church, we allow darkness into our eyes. In the Greek, the eye it's not just eyes, but it's the understanding of the mind in that verse. The faculty of knowing. The lamp, talks about a lamp, is a candle that is placed on a stand. When we allow the darkness into our lives, it's going to perpetuate darkness coming out. It's the word of God. I used to hear people say, oh, it doesn't bother me. It doesn't work. It does bother me. It does affect you, and we need to really think about what we're allowing into our eyes, into our ears, into our discussion. God has had to call me in, and honestly, church, I, even as of late, I am more and more gravitating away from what I deem to be darkness. Some of the TV we watch is horrible. It is horrible. The movies that we allow ourselves to see, oh, they don't bother you. They bother you. They affect you. And what comes out, the world sees. The literature, the discussions. We need to know. We need to take, we need to consider our ways. 1 Thessalonians 5, 21 and 22. Well, why? Why do I need to? Let me go here. Why do I need to think about this. First Thessalonians, Thessalonians 5, 21 and 22 says, but examine everything carefully. Hold fast to that which is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Abstain, another word in the Greek was reject. Every form, and form is just the outward appearance of evil. Reject every form of evil. Now, well, you might say, well, what are you talking about? If I turn the TV on, and I've walked in the house and the TV has been on, and in that show, 
they are talking about something that God's word doesn't even, God's word says, don't even talk about the things done in darkness. The funny thing is, these things aren't even in darkness anymore. Now it's just open. Don't even talk about it. And yet, I am allowing that into my mind. And darkness is coming back out. That is just the way it is. And that, I have observed that in, in this church. Hebrews 12, 1 says, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has set down the right hand of the throne of God. Sin that entangles. Church, if we're letting darkness in, it's entangling us. It just is. This is only one thing. You know, like, there are others. We have a cloud of witnesses. I'll end this. I'm going to read this one. I love this verse. This is a Bible quiz verse. I've read it before here. But here's how we can know. Here's how we know if it's actually okay. What means for a well-known verse. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute or reputation, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, well on these things. Church, if we're watching, we're allowing stuff that doesn't match up with that into our life. We are sinning. That is sin. Understand that. I'm going to say this. Some of the sitcoms that we watch are sinful for us to watch. I'm sorry. It's just the way it is. Don't even try to get around it. It's in the book. One other thing, working under the table, what is that? Let me translate what the Bible says. You're stealing from the government and then lying on your tax return when you sign it. Just, I'll leave it at that. That's what it is. You know, I, that's a pet peeve of mine and, and I've seen that more times than I should. So let me elaborate. How, what, what does that mean? How does that all play into our testimony? When we do these things, in our life. I said before, I said, you could say, well, they, people don't know. People don't know that I'm doing that. Well, first of all, God's word says if you let darkness in, darkness is coming out. And you might be able to hide it from the world. Let me put it this way. If the accuser of the brethren is just waiting for you to screw up, he's standing before Almighty God. He's saying, I'm like saying, you yeah, just signed it. Tax return, and he didn't claim that two thousand dollars. That what can God? Do? I want God to be able to shove it right back down Satan's mouth when he comes for me and say, "Yeah, he made a mistake, but look at here, he fixed it. He again claimed the blood of the lamb. He he repented of his sin. But when you live in open sin, when you allow." things sin into your life openly. What can God do? I mean, in a human term, if, my, if someone came and said something about my kid and I couldn't defend them, I did have to hang my head. Do you want God to be put in that position by the choices you make, by the testimony that you bring forth? I don't. I definitely don't. I tell you, church, here's, here's what I see. I have a tape, uh, uh, a music uh, CD that we got when we went, I believe, to Washington. I'm sure some of the guys here, big million man, that uh, was a Christian thing. But uh, it was a number, quite a number of years ago. But in it, there's a, a part where he says, you know, why is the darkness, I'm paraphrasing, why is the darkness getting darker? He says, it's not the darkness's fault. Darkness is darkness. It's the light. 
the light is getting less, so the darkness is just becoming more prevalent. We, what are we doing? What does the Bible say? It's to separate yourself from the world. We're not doing that. We're assimilating. In Star Trek, the board assimilate everybody. That's what we're doing. We're assimilating. We're becoming like the world. It's got to change, church. It's got to change. So those are simple. Simple testimonies. Knowingly, knowingly, we're knowingly doing things that, and if we don't know it, today you know it. At least these things. Today you know it. You can say you're wrong like that. Fine. But those are simple. Selfish testimony. I don't want a selfish testimony. It's not necessarily sin, but it's choices that are, that are selfish. Jonah, Prophet Jonah, probably put his actions in sinful too, but we'll, we'll, for, for argument's sake. He did not want to go to Nineveh. He did not want to see those people saved. And he did everything in his power to get away. Are my choices keeping people from God? Am I doing what he wants me to do or am I doing what I want? God knew that Nineveh was right to, do, to repent. And he needed Jonah. He wanted Jonah to go to him. Go to them. And when he did, they repented. Again, our social life, our choices, again, Haggai, um, I read before, one, five, or seven, says, consider your ways. Are we spending more time on our own things than on God things? Are we making choices with our life? I, you know what? I, I'm amazed at the social lives of our, love, our young people. Going to bars. I'm not saying it's wrong, but church, if you're not there to witness and save souls, I don't know. I have a hard time with that. I really do. I'm not going to say it's, it's sin, but I don't know how light it is. In my opinion, I'd much rather be here on a Friday night with my buddy John than doing stuff like that. I get a lot more joy and a lot more happiness and peace out of that. I just don't think we know it. I don't think we experience that. One thing I pray to God, pour your spirit down that song, that new song we sing. Pour out your spirit on us so we can sense and feel that power again. Do we care? Do we even care? There's a tough one. I've had to, I've had to uh, draw back on this. Attitude towards life. I have walked through those doors on a Sunday morning. And I asked someone, how you doing? I'm getting old. I'm hurting. And I understand that because I'm getting old and I'm, I'm hurting. But God called me and he said, who am I that you're more interested in how you feel and what's going on around you than the potential of what God can do. And God really called me on it. What are we, what are we telling the world when we say, we should be saying, you know, you know, I'm getting old and it's hurting, but you know what, God is good. And that's from, from the movie, I forgot, God is not dead, and I don't know which one it was. God is good. And I say that a lot, though, because God is. We have to. We have to proclaim that. We have to believe that. I do because I've seen him do pretty cool things. But we have to. We have to go to that place of, of stop focusing on the negative and start focusing on what we believe. I think I told this in another. I, I preached at Wolka in, in July. I don't think I told it here, but my wife bless. My wife blesses me and allows me to go on a fishing trip. Every year. Did I tell that here? I don't know. She's, she's shaking her head. Anyway, that is one of the most favorite of my trips because I can go away and kind of like check out someone. And I thought about this three weeks before we went this last summer and I thought, look at how excited I am to go on this trip. 
I mean, it, it lifts me up. It, me, Dan, Tommy Nab, um, Jimmy Sakata, Joe Charles, and you know him. We go on this trip, and it is great. Well, Sunday church, we're going to heaven. Did we forget that? Did we forget the tell the world thing? Oh, geez, man, I'm old. Uh, I, got, I got issues. That's not just old, you know. It's a, my job, I could, you know, I could go. It's like, no. We're going to heaven someday, and that should be my focus, and that's what I should be telling people. That's what we should, that should be our testimony. Isaiah 26, 3 says, I will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on me. I had to learn that hard many years ago. But I've learned it to a point where it truly gives me peace and joy. Psalm 16, 11 says, in your presence is fullness of joy. Do we know that? Do we practice that? No, we're trying to fill our lives with stuff. At least to some degree. There's another selfish testimony. Refusal to participate in functions of the church. <laughs> Little or no involvement in church activity. I understand church. There are times in our life when things happen. But we're the church. God calls us to be one. We're the body. Every part works together. I'm sorry, but it's selfish. If we come to church on Sunday and we don't give anything else, it's just selfish. Interaction with those outside of our comfort zone. I've had to work at that. We need to go to each other and love each other. What do you think will happen if we say, okay, I, this is hard for me, but I'm going to do this because Pastor Mike said we should go do it. God bless you. Last night we had our life group, our young adult group. And I said to him, I says, we don't know what God can do if we don't ask him to do it. You know, one of the things Josh said was, let's reach out. Matt, Matt, her husband said, let's reach out. I said, well, let's do that. Let's reach out. Let's see what God will do. God knows. If we give him the chance, God knows. And he will let us reach out. We had the Hubbards here a couple weeks ago. And... All through the years, I know, I understand, you don't get a lot of people coming. But church, if the church has an event, and by the way, if you didn't come and you could have, you missed out. You definitely missed out. I'm telling you, he, he told a testimony. This is a repeat to some of but he told a testimony about a church he went to in India where he went into the church. He was tired. He went into the church. There was two women on the floor. One possessed. And the other one praying for her. And so they went and prayed for her. And then the guy that was taking care of what was going on in the church came in, motioned for Greg to come away as they're praying for this woman writhing on the ground. And he starts asking him, you know, hey, how's your trip? Blah, 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 you know. And, and Greg's like, there's a, like a demon-possessed lady on the ground here. And, you're... and he's talking a little more. And he just looks at this woman and he says, Jesus! And the, woman, the, the demon laughed. And I said, I said, that should be our testimony. Not, not that we want demon possessed people all over the place, but that should be our testimony. Amen. That God is powerful in our life. He said, he also said in a different church, he got to the church, Mark Bliss told him, you're going to preach to these people, they're probably going to fall asleep. You know, and, and, and he didn't explain it. Greg, Greg was like, well, they fell asleep. After the fact, he found out, and, and he found out that they had traveled four to five days to get to these services, these, this week of services. And he said, people got saved, people that were asleep got filled with the Holy Spirit. Think about that. Consider our ways. I want that church. I, I, I desperately want that. I really do. One last thing in this. Our worship, we come to church as a body, as a family. If we come to worship, we need to worship. We need to be more inclined to worship than to play with our cell phones. <clears throat> cell phones are a bane in my side. I 
I'm a production manager, and they literally call me the cell phone Nazi because of the trouble that they have caused and what we have had to do. It just permeates their lives. Church, when you come to worship, we need to worship. It doesn't matter what the music are, it is, doesn't matter who's up there. It doesn't matter. You're here to worship God, we need to worship. How are those who are watching motivated? The church, if I am, if, if, you know, I was taught something. These are tough things. I understand that. But God wants us to be better. How is my brother, if I come into this body and I'm playing with my cell phone during church, and I know some of us use them for, it's, it's tough because if you're using it to follow, and this and that, that's one thing. That I can usually tell if someone's texting. You know, you can see. But if I, my brother, if, if he sees me doing something like that, what does that, now he has to make a decision. Your testimony affects his testimony. He's now battling because he thinks, well, if he can do it, I can do it. And, or if he can do this, or if he can watch this show on TV, or he, you know, your testimony affects their testimony. I don't want my testimony to be a bad one. I'm seeking, do we have a seeking testimony? And yeah, you can be great. I mean, it's these some areas. We could have some sin. I don't want any. We can have some selfishness. I don't want any. Do I still have some? I do. God's working on me. But what is it? What is seeking? Okay. First Peter 15 and 6. First Peter. Peter 3, 15 and 16. But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence and keep a good conscience so that in the thing in which you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. If you apply that to your life, you will have a seeking testimony. Our disciplines in the secret place, our good consciences, will manifest in the public place. That's the testimony that I want. Do our lives tell the world we are seeking him in all instances? When we sin, does the world see a repentant, seeking heart? If this is not us, why not? You know, I, on Wednesday nights, we're having uh, Dan's doing this series. And Mark 1.22 says, Jesus spoke with authority and he's a They were amazed at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one having authority. I said, I said, Jesus said we would do greater things than me. I want that to be me. I want that authority. I want to proclaim the greater things. 